Joyce of Justice League to the second episode of JJL Live. This is part two, where I cover all things good and bad in relation to Sony's PlayStation brand. So let's start off with the good. Some really exciting news uh, for fans of AAA shooters, especially. We finally broke the radio silence on the status of Planetside 2 for the PS4, which if you don't know what it is, I'll kind of get you up to speed. Planetside 2 is a free to play first person shooter MMO, which was made by Sony Online Entertainment, responsible for bringing us previous hits like EverQuest and DC Universe Online, which also which was ported over to the PlayStation 3 and PlayStation 4 consoles. So this game has already been out for a couple of years on the PC platform and it's done really well. It has a very loyal, dedicated following and uh, you know, it doesn't hurt that the game received really great reviews when it came out. I believe IGN gave Planetside 2 an 8.9 out of 10, citing its, its incredible graphics, its gameplay ambitious, and it's just, it's large scale battles. I mean, I watch, I haven't played it personally, but I've watched a lot of gameplay footage of it, and I've also spoken to people who have had direct experience with the game. It's this massive battlefield, and it's, it's not uncommon to go from skirmish to skirmish and fight with up to 50 players, but using mechanics that are very, very similar to Halo. And that's what one of my friends, uh, Tethered, said, that if you like Halo, you're really gonna like Planet Side 2, and, and especially Halo on like this massive, massively multiplayer online scale. So you've got ground troops, you, have, you, you can take command of various vehicles, tanks, and, and uh, buggies, you can get into aircraft and, and, and do airstrikes. Really, there are so many different ways to play this game and, and it's definitely ambitious. There's a lot going on. And I think that's why uh, Sony Online Entertainment was so slow to give us details because they really wanted to make sure this was gonna work on the PlayStation 4. It wasn't just gonna be another kind of half-assed port like DC Universe Online. And, and Matt Higby speaking to Eurogamer last week um, said that when the beta finally arrives for the PS4 at the end of this year, you can expect to see certain things. For instance, the user interface, Higby claims, has been completely built, rebuilt from the ground up for the PlayStation 4 console experience because they said that they didn't want to just simply port the PC game over to consoles. You know, that wouldn't do it justice. They wanted to make it feel, make the player feel as if this was designed for them. And, and I think this is a good thing to do because having played the port of DC Universe Online for the PlayStation 4 or PlayStation 3, it was admirable to see what they were trying to achieve, and for the most part, they, they did make it a fully functioning game, but there was a lot wanting in terms of, of, of how the interface worked on intuitive skill. It really felt like the game was designed for a mouse and keyboard and didn't translate exactly over to an experience where you use like a dual shock controller. So they, they, they're aiming to fix this and to make this work better on the console. But really what people want to know about is how this very ambitious, graphically heavy and action heavy game is going to work on the PlayStation 4 hardware. And, and as if you've been following, uh, you know, the, over the past year, we've been finding out slowly and slowly that the PlayStation 4 is a bit underpowered in terms of consistently providing 1080p 60 frame a second experience, especially when it comes to shooters. So addressing these concerns, Higby said that the PS4 version will use the same ultra textures, full particle effects, and shadows and lighting effects from the PC version, and that they are aiming to get this running at 1080p 60 frames a second. The key word here is aiming because he does go on later in the interview to say that if we have to settle on 30 frames a second, we'll ensure that it has at least a fluid locked in 30 frames a second. And I think he's being realistic here. I think that this game is really ambitious to do on the PlayStation, ver the PlayStation 4 hardware alone. It it's admirable to, admirable to see them try, and we'll see more of it in play next month when they finally reveal the game at the PlayStation uh, Experience event in Las Vegas from December 6th to 7th, which is most likely when they'll give us a firm date on the end of the year beta rollout and maybe more insight into the launch window in 2015. But regardless, we're gonna get to see the game in action. I don't think it's gonna be that big of a deal if initially Planet Side 2 is running at 30 frames a second. You know, as we've seen, you know, the Crucible on Destiny runs at 30 frames a second, and it is playable. Not as enjoyable as playing Call of Duty Advanced Warfare is at 60 frames, but it's passable. But 
if you stay tuned to the rest of this podcast, and when we get into the cloud gaming discussion at the end of this podcast and the Greek speaks, I'm going to talk about how cloud gaming is going to change gaming going into the next couple of years and how even if Planet Side 2 is running at a, at, a, at, a, at a lower settings than the PC counterpart, it's not going to matter over the long term because I think that Planet Side 2 is one of those experiences that it, it, it has a long term plan, it has a long term goal of becoming something better over time. We'll get over into that over the course of this podcast. So Planet Side 2 finally has a beta release coming at the end of the year. Stay tuned for more announcements as the PlayStation experience happens next month and I report on it. Also in Sony news, not really on the gaming front, but I see this as exciting news from a TV viewing perspective. And I know you're gonna, what you're gonna say, oh, why are you talking about TV capabilities on the PS4 or on, a, on a gaming podcast? And, and it just it's just really indicative of how Sony not only wants to innovate the video game space, but also wants to innovate the entertainment space as a whole and and it was funny last week sean Layden, the head of sony computer entertainment america was doing an investor call and just kind of casually revealed that playstation is getting into the tv business and they unveiled playstation view vue which is going to be their version of streaming television and it's very different from what microsoft's decided to do with the Xbox One and I'll get into, I'll, I'll try to explain because there's a lot of inform information I got to kind of pack into four minutes here about why I feel PlayStation View is going to be important. Sean Layden is saying that the TV industry has stagnated for like the last few decades. It hasn't really innovated much and what they're trying to do along with Dish Network and their similar streaming service which is going to come out next year is they're trying to reinvent the TV space. So PlayStation View is going to limited beta by the end of this year in limited markets. So we're talking about New York, LA, Chicago, Philadelphia, and then it's gonna be gradually rolled out to the rest of North America over the course of early 2015. So what they're promising is that unlike Xbox One TV, which requires a connect to function to do all the motion commands with your hands and requires an archaic set top box provided by your cable provider, which simply just passes through the Xbox One console to give you a new type of Xbox centric TV guide, the PlayStation 4 and PlayStation 3 on the other hand, all you required is a broadband connection. You do not need a cable contract. They want to get out of the cable business. They want to get cons people who are cord cutting. And this is going to be a new term that's going to gain ground in 2015 as you see more and more people severing their relationships with the old cable providers and looking for alternatives like Netflix, like HBO Go. Stuff that appeals to them without having to pay for an entire cable package of shows that, in featuring shows that they don't want to see with all of these hidden costs which cable companies are notorious for. And, and what I what I respect about Sony's approach to PlayStation View is that they're trying to be transparent. They're saying, look, like Netflix, you're going to pay a monthly subscription fee and you are going to get what you pay for. And if you stop paying, we're going to cut you off. It's very simple. There's not going to be any hidden fees like what Time Warner does in the US uh, with this thing, uh, what's it called? It's called, um, it's called teaser rate, okay? So basically they'll advertise this, you know, too good to be true cable rate, suck you in and after about a year or two, you find that your cable bill has doubled with all these hidden fees. They're trying to eliminate that and try to get you into more of an experience that is controlled by you and what you want to see at, a, at like a lower monthly subscription cost. So with the beta, they're going to be rolling out about 75 functional channels that you can access right away via your PlayStation 4, PS3. And that's going to include some major heavy hitters, which includes the CBS network, the Discovery network. Uh, who else is on this list? Uh, NBC Universal. We have Viacom, which includes BT, Nickelodeon, MTV. The only ones that aren't on this list yet, and Sony says that these licensing deals do take time to go into effect, you're not going to see Disney and Time Warner. So meaning ESPN, ABC, Disney Channel, HBO, those aren't currently available. But I think they have the right approach. And, and to see that Dish Network is doing something similar with their service, I, I think we this really is the death knell for television in the traditional sense, the whole idea that you have to go either rent a cable box or buy one flat out. Now you're just gonna use your PlayStation 4 or PlayStation, PlayStation 3 as your set-top box. I mean, look, it's PlayStation 4 is one of the fastest selling consoles of all time. It's getting into homes 
and people like me who have, have lost faith in the TV system, who have moved on to Netflix and streaming stuff online, I find this interesting, especially if they can get it down to say like a $30 per month price point. I like this because not only are you gonna be able to live stream television, but they're gonna leverage the power of the Gaikai Cloud to allow you to archive up to three days worth of material. So let's say you miss your, your favorite show, it's gonna be in the archive for three days. And not only that, but you can also smart tag your favorite shows so that they'll be available up to 28 days in the cloud. So really, it remains to be seen not only how many more companies get on board? I, I think the HBO factor is the big glaring omission. I think HBO is kind of on top of the world right now. And with HBO, it's not really going to go to that next step. But it shows that people want something different and that PlayStation is on top of the innovation ladder and, and, and addressing things that Microsoft got wrong in its approach to providing TV through the Xbox One. They're making it simpler, cheaper, and more transparent, which is what we all want to see. So that's the end of the, uh, we've run out of time for the Sony News Roundup. Uh, let it, like I said, like the, the comments below these videos are an open forum. If there's something I haven't gotten to or something I haven't addressed it, uh, feel free to sound off in the comments. And like I said earlier in the uh, earlier on, if I do miss any of the headlines that are on my agenda, I'll probably share them on my Facebook page for Joystick Joy Justice League. So stay tuned. We'll be coming back with all things Microsoft in the next segment. I'm Mike Frusios for JJL Live. Stay tuned.